Hey everyone, so since making the Breton language video a couple of weeks ago, it became pretty popular and people have left a ton of amazing and super helpful comments and feedback and thank you all so much, I really appreciate every single comment. After the little perceived inaccuracy with this map that prompted the Breton video, I decided why not just go down the list and talk about all the Celtic languages. The map gives a great general overview and I like it, but it's way oversimplified and I think it's a bit outdated. And all of these numbers are nuanced, not very accurate, and definitely deserve some background. Also because the Celtic languages are freaking fascinating and don't get enough love out there, in my opinion. Anyway, the case of Breton is truly interesting and unfortunately unfortunate, and to all the Breton people out there, I wish the very best. And today we're going to be talking about a language related to Breton, and that is Cornish, also known as Kernovec. Cornish is native to Cornwall, home to the southernmost point of mainland Great Britain, known as Lizard Point, not to be confused with Land's End, which is the southwesternmost point. The reason it's called Lizard Point, by the way, is because lizard sounds a lot like lizard, which in Cornish means high court. The story of Cornish is fascinating, it's full of unexpected twists and turns that will just blow your mind. Now the map claims that Cornish went extinct around the year 1800, and there's a second language revival going on right now with possibly hundreds of speakers. Also it seems to be the only one that doesn't include a date. The year 1800 is debatable, and possibly hundreds of speakers is technically correct, but doesn't quite do it justice. Let me explain. The Cornish people are descended from ancient Celtic tribes that have inhabited much of Western Europe for thousands of years. Then the Anglo-Saxons happened, and then the Norman Conquest happened, and then in 1337 the Duchy of Cornwall was created, kind of cementing Cornwall's place permanently within the emerging British Empire. This was also around a time when Cornish pretty much reached the peak of the amount of its speakers at around 39,000 as some sources say, and we get a certain period when Cornish actually flourished for a little bit. Between the end of the 12th century and the beginning of the 16th century was when many works of literature were written in Cornish. Additionally, there are the so-called miracle plays performed at plain unquarries, sort of like medieval amphitheaters for sports, public events, and plays. For example, there's the Ordinalia, a 9,000-line religious verse drama written around the year 1400. It's performed in three parts over three days and is considered to be one of the most important surviving pieces of literature written in Cornish. Fast forward almost 100 years and King Henry VII raises taxes because he needs money to fight the Scottish. The Cornish are pretty pissed off at this, and understandably so, because one, they're one of the poorest regions to begin with, and two, they couldn't care less about Henry's beef with the Scottish. And so, the Cornish Rebellion of 1497 happens, which doesn't go very well, and about a thousand people were put to death. Fast forward another 50 years or so, and another Henry, and Andrew Board, a Welsh writer, gives an account in his 1542 first book of the introduction of knowledge, which reads quite hilariously, In Cornwall is two speeches, the one is naughty English, and the other Cornish speech, and there be many men and women, the which cannot speak a one word of English, but all Cornish. Interestingly, in the same book, Bord is also talking crap about Cornish beer, which he describes as thick and smoky, and also it is thin. It is like wash as pigs had wrestled therein. Ouch. I tried Cornish beer. It's, it's not that bad. It's, it's alright, I guess. <laughs> Anyway, seven years later, in 1549, the Act of Uniformity is passed by Parliament, which aimed to replace Latin with English in churches during the Anglican Church Reformation. The Cornish were, again, very understandably pissed off, and this incited the Prayer Book Rebellion of 1549. You might think, but hold on, how is Latin, which was used previously, any better than English? Well, at least it had already been Latin for the past thousand plus years, so everybody was kind of used to it, and also, nobody likes the English. The rebels' document claimed... We the Cornishmen, whereof certain of us understand no English, utterly refuse this new English. This also didn't go very well for the Cornish, and about 4,000 people were killed. The consensus among most historians and linguists is that this is the ultimate turning point and is the beginning of the rapid decline of Cornish. Additionally, the Cornish were predominantly Catholic, and their persecution put an end to the thousand-year connection between them and Brittany, which has done much to sustain Cornish until that point. In 1498, in some southern Cornish ports, Breton people constituted between 63 and 94 percent of overall maritime traffic, and not anymore. While all of this is happening, by the way, there were a lot of people immigrating to Cornwall, thereby pushing the language deeper into the rural areas of the peninsula, little by little, every century. The 17th century saw the greatest reduction of Cornish speakers, as at this point, the British Empire is pretty much a thing, and nobody wants to be left behind, so let's learn the language of the future, English. This is when a certain antiquary by the name of William Scowen, who, by the way, is probably the most self-aware historian ever, writes, It may, I confess, be lamented and heavily laid to the charge of us and our ancestors to have been much wanting to ourselves in the loss of the Cornish speech. And 350 years later, he was right. 
And around the year 1700, another antiquary by the name of Edward Clwyd writes about the state of Cornish in 24 parishes he's visited. A great many of the inhabitants of those parishes, especially the gentry, do not understand it, and everyone is able to speak good English. This guy, by the way, was also among the first to know the similarities between Cornish, Breton, Welsh, Irish, Scottish, Gaelic, and Manx, and thanks to him, we now know them collectively as the Celtic languages. And now, we reach the year 1777, when the alleged last known fluent native speaker of Cornish, Dolly Pentreath, passes away, and with her, whatever remained of the thousands of years of Cornish culture and tradition. A monument in her memory was erected at Paul in 1860 by none other than, get this, Louis Lucien Bonaparte, one of the Napoleon's nephews, who, as it turns out, was an avid linguist and antiquary. Maybe he was trying to wash away the damage that Uncle Napoleon did to Breton. Back to last speakers, though. Some dispute Dolly Pentry's claim, as there is evidence of other people with some knowledge of Cornish surviving into the 19th and even the beginning of the 20th centuries. This is quite hard to verify, though, especially now, all this time later, but it's likely that those people only had limited knowledge of Cornish. The same William Scowan that I mentioned earlier also writes about a woman called Cheston Marchant, which he believed to be the last monolingual Cornish speaker, which is fine, but then he also writes that she was 165 years old at the time of her death, which is a big claim. There's even a Wikipedia page called Last Speaker of the Cornish Language, which lists all of the claims over the years. Whatever is the case, as Cornish scholar R. Morton Nance puts it, we must accept 1800 as being about the very latest date at which anyone really spoke Cornish traditionally, as even the remnant of a living language, all traditional Cornish since then, having been learned parrot-wise from those of an earlier generation. The story of Cornish doesn't end here, though, as in the beginning of the 20th century, a language and cultural revival began. The revival is considered to have officially begun in 1904, when Henry Jenner published his Handbook of the Cornish Language. He wrote it after he traveled around Cornwall, collecting Cornish language works and speaking to people who may still know a few words and phrases, and people whose parents and grandparents spoke the language. All traditional Cornish and modern Cornish aren't 100% the same language, as many things were lost and much new vocabulary was added because of all the new technology and concepts that didn't exist back in the day. And seeing as pretty much all modern Cornish speakers are native English speakers, I assume the pronunciation differs quite a bit as well to the original Cornish. And then, between the 1960s and 1990s is when all the organizations started forming. The Cornish Language Board, the Cornish Language Partnership, the Cornish Language Fellowship, and others. In 2003, Cornish was officially recognized under the Council of Europe's European Charter for Regional or Minority Languages, and the UK government has been allocating between 120 to 150,000 pounds to the development of Cornish. But probably the best year for Cornish was 2010, when UNESCO announced that its former classification of extinct no longer applies, and Cornish is once again a living language in the eyes of the world. The same year, the first Cornish language nursery slash daycare opened, where children aged 2 to 5 are immersed in the Cornish language. It's also beginning to be taught in schools and universities. There's also a ton of Cornish language music and even films, newspapers, and magazines. There's Cornish language radio with hundreds of podcasts just in Cornish. There's this website I found, entirely in Cornish, like there's not even the English option. I, I don't know what it says. <laughs> and finally, in 2014, the Cornish people were officially recognized as a national minority of the UK, alongside the Irish, Scottish, and Welsh, within the European Framework Convention for the Protection of National Minorities. Today, there's an estimated total of about 3,000 people who speak some Cornish, and out of those, about 2,000 claim to be fluent. While in the 2011 UK census, there were approximately 600 people who declared Cornish to be their main language of use in everyday life. Now, does all of this match what the map says? Ish, but aren't you now glad you know why? This has been one of the most successful language revivals in recent times, and you should definitely read more about the Cornish language people and their fascinating history, from King Arthur to pirates to pastries. Cornish can even be heard in the 1994 movie Legends of the Fall about an immigrant Cornish family to America, starring Brad Pitt and Anthony Hopkins. Cornish never had it easy, but despite the abuse, despite the neglect, despite actually going extinct, Cornish managed to rise from the ashes and persevere. Even if it's only confined to a few small circles and communities, it's still alive, and it's important to those people, and it gives them a unique sense of identity, and it adds more color to us as people in general. I hold nothing but respect for the Cornish people and wish them nothing but success in their journey. Kernobis Vikend.